Welcome to the show Beyond the Journal, where we will discuss social media, digital education, and current controversies in cancer and medicine. I'm Dr. Jack West, Associate Clinical Professor in Medical Oncology at the City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area, and I'm happy to be joined by my co-host, Dr. Charo Agarwal, Leslie M. Heisler, Associate Professor of Lung Cancer at the University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Uh, I'd like to also just start by saying that if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, whether on your podcast service, the Beacon MedIC website, YouTube, etc. And please leave a review, some feedback. We're really interested in that. But uh, with that, let's uh, turn to say hello to Charu. Hi, Jack. Uh, today we are welcoming Dr. Aaron Goodman uh, to our show to talk a little bit more about um, social media engagement and education. Dr. Aaron Goodman is an associate professor of medicine within the Division of Blood and Marrow Transplantation at the University of California in San Diego. Welcome, Aaron. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Look forward to this. Great. Well, let's just start with your your entry into social media, which at least in a professional capacity, as far as I can tell, is pretty recent. You joined Twitter in 2017, and I understand that you didn't really go in whole hog even at that time. But I'd love to know, uh, at this point, you have a very devoted uh, following uh, and, and bring in huge engagement in educational stuff, which I think seems to be your passion. Can you talk about just what brought you into social media? Was it seeking to find a platform to educate? Was it something else? And you know, what are your thoughts about uh, coming into Twitter versus whatever else you might have done in the past? Yeah. So um, as you said, I, I joined Twitter in 2017 uh, based off the advice of a colleague um, I, I asked her how she stays up with the literature, and she had told me that Twitter was a great medium, medium for that uh, if you follow the right people. Uh, so at that point, I signed on, um, uh, made an account, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't get it. Actually, I didn't like Twitter. Um, it was just um, another kind of inbox to add to my list and things to check, and people just tweeted things that I didn't seem to care about. So I, I didn't use it, uh, and I kind of sat, you know, you know, closed for a few years, and Right before COVID, around the start of COVID, I, uh, I I signed back on. I don't actually remember why I just started doing it, but I, I did. Uh, maybe there was a void in my life I was looking to fill. Uh, uh, but I signed back on to Twitter, and uh, I started following some uh, some names I recognized in the bone marrow transplant hematology uh, uh, field. Uh, and uh, I also started following, their, uh, as I think most people know, Dr. Vinay Prasad, um, who um, I found some of his views uh, uh, resonated with me. Some did not, but some did. Uh, basically, his views on, on on the need for, um, you know, more robust data before we uh, use certain drugs in oncology, uh, highlighting toxicity and just uh, uh, really being uh, more, um, you know, more thoughtful with some of our practices in oncology. And I started tweeting similar things of that. You know, I'm particularly passionate about not treating smoldering myeloma, and I could have a whole show about that. Uh, I'm uh, uh, particularly passionate about, you know, we do a lot of making up in oncology, I feel like, and sometimes that has a role uh, uh, in special circumstances, but a lot of the times, like in a newly diagnosed patient with AML or uh, something else that's treatable and curable, um, making up shouldn't be happening outside of uh, clinical trials. When I say making up, just throwing added agents because it makes sense uh, on paper. And um, I tweeted about that for a little bit, but that, you know, I kind of got tired of that. And um, I was teaching the residents uh, uh, about antibiotics. I, I do a lot of teaching. That's actually the main reason why I wanted to be an academic uh, oncologist. I, I could only work at a university where there's students, residents. I love teaching every aspect. I never say no to a, a teaching lecture. If I get the email, I find time, I find time and I get rid of something else. That's what I like doing. Um, and I, I do, I have an antibiotic lecture I give to the, even though I'm a BMT doctor, an antibiotic lecture I give to the, the students and residents. And one of them said like, this is phenomenal the way you teach it. I've learned antibiotics a gazillion times. 
but the way you broke it down in the way that not only makes sense, but is clinically useful, which I think is kind of lacking in a lot of the teaching we do with PowerPoints, uh, you know, and I'm no, no, I'm not dissing world experts, but you know, when you're a medical student and um, learning about lung cancer and the world expert gives you the lung cancer talk, uh, what, what the medical student needs to know is not maybe what the world expert lung cancer doctor thinks it is important and sometimes forgets the audience. At least that was the complaints I had uh, when I was uh, in medical education. So I always make it a huge point when I'm teaching to really teach to the audience and what they're trying to get out of it. So, you know, I was teaching the medicine residents about antibiotics and kind of how I do it. And one of them said like, you know, this is really good. And, um, you know, uh, um, try, try Twitter and teaching a little bit about it. And I thought about it and uh, I was like, that's maybe not a bad idea. I mean, why do I go to Twitter? I go to Twitter to learn, um, to, to learn little nuggets from things that I don't think about, to, to meet people. I go there for humor. Um, I go there for a little bit of controversy. Uh, and these were all things that I liked. So I was like, well, maybe I should just start combining all those things that I think are the perfect Twitter account uh, into something I do. So I, I, I did a tweet about antibiotics, which is from my antibiotic talk. Um, it's abbreviated. And um, I take pride, I took pride in crafting it that time to make it fit into one tweet, which, as you know, if you tweet, it can be kind of hard sometimes with the uh, character uh, constraints. And um, a lot of people liked it. I, you know, got a couple thousand likes and retweets and a gazillion people started following me. Uh, you know, not a gazillion, but from like the 10 to like a couple hundred. And, you know, I'll be honest, it feels good. I, I don't care what anyone says, you know, and I, I own it. Like when people like it and follow you, they're like, oh, someone's interested in what I have to say. And there is a reward you get from that. And that's the, I think that's why a lot of us like social media. There is this gratifying reward. And not only that, I had people follow me from like, at the start, there were a lot of people from Brazil, uh, India, you know, places that I had never been. And I never would have communicated with these individuals at all. And now I had something they were interested for the, you know, what I had to say. And uh, as I've talked about, I'm a, I'm an academic oncologist. I publish, but you know, I'm not like the big trial leaders. I'm not in that group. And uh, it made me feel good. So I, I started tweeting more education and, um, and I tweet what, I was particularly focusing on things that I always found confusing in hematology, which is quite a bit of hematology. Hematology is a hard field um, due to the diversity of the malignancies, uh, the amount we know now about these malignancies and the rarity of a lot of these. And there are just a lot of confusing concepts in hematology. And um, I, I, throughout my training, I, I would spend um, hours, you know, weeks, really like when I want to learn something, my dad still says it today, when I want to learn something, I'm pretty hardcore. You know, I want to, I want to dominate it. I mean, I'm being serious. Like I, I need to not just know about it, but I need to know every little thing about it, how it relates to other things that I'm confused with key differences. And, um, that's how I learned things. And, um, when I started to think of things for tweet, I was like, well, what's always been confusing. And, and, and those are things that I tweet about. And I try to really highlight in these tweets, things that are confusing and then key differences. So the people would understand these things and maybe remember them throwing a little bit of humor. So they would find it more enjoyable. And, um, it just took off from there. And there's an unlimited amount of stuff to, to, to tweet about in hematology. And the more I did it, the more followers, the more likes. And, you know, then I started getting like, you know, it's it's funny, but like big names in hematology, people who I never would have met otherwise, uh, leaders in the fields, you know, with that are on all the papers that I read, you know, like the, the heroes of hematology were following with me and engaging with me. And um, I, I, it feels good. And and, uh, and I think people I get direct messages all the time for more content uh, to make videos. And um, it's becoming a lot now. And it's becoming a big time commitment, too. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I, 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 about a few months ago, maybe it was already four or five months ago, um, I was sitting with my family on a vacation. My wife, my dad, my brother was around. Um, and we hadn't actually seen each other in a while. Uh, this was after the vaccination and, and for COVID. And um, my brother who's into advertising. He's like, you need to be more catchy. You know, you need to you need a name. And so one of my Twitter uh, followers at one time called me the Papa of Hematology. I think he was from France. And, and it, it, it uh it that I remembered that. So I was like, what about Papa Heem? And then they laughed and I was like, I'm doing it. So I did it. And I don't think anyone noticed for a few days. And then um, people started to notice. And then I showed back to work and everyone was giggling. And I was like, what's so funny? 
I, I, my, the nurses were giggling and they're like, your Papa Heem on Twitter. I'm like, and then I was a little embarrassed. And I, and I was like, Aaron, either you own this or you, I go. And then I was like, yeah, I'm Papa Heem and I'm proud of it. And then of course they told all my coworkers who really ripped on me and I'm buddies. We have a, we have a really, I, I am fortunate BMT at UCSD. There's nine or 10 of us. And, you know, not only are we great colleagues, we're like, all good friends we hang out and like it, it, it's a privilege to work with them and like and we you know in bmt we all take care of each other's patients it's very important on the inpatient service and we get along like you know my colleagues i'm in their office all the time having coffee going through cases but they were ripping on me and making fun of me and then i just i just uh, owned it and now they're not making fun of me anymore <laughs> you know they're like look what are you doing this afternoon i'm like i'm being interviewed on a podcast I'm like oh you know uh <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, I've so been, I have to I've ask you, Aaron, um, this this has just been so fun listening to you. But, you know, you started to talk about, um, you know, really producing content in a way uh, for an audience. So initially, did you think that you would have an audience comprised of um, or were you for? on medical students based on your lectures? Or did you think that you would reach a larger audience like hematologists? Um, what, what was your intent? I understand things have evolved over time, but initially when you thought about putting educational content out, what did you have in mind? For me, it was hematology fellows. Initially, it was hematology fellows. But then, you know, you know, I thought this through. There's only so many hematology fellows on Twitter. Uh, um, and... Um, I wanted to expand my audience. So I started tailoring tweets um, towards residents and, and actually medical students, uh, which are a very active group on Twitter. This was not the case when I was in medical school, uh, um, but there's a, a lot of medical students and I would design tweets. And you know, they, clearly uh, a leukemia doctor would be like, I don't care about this, but like just basic differences between like ALL and AML, you know, stuff that, uh, that is actually super important and confusing for medical students. And with that, I was, I would say, tapping into new audiences uh, and expanding my reach. And I started getting lots of medical student followers, residents, um, uh, you know, nurses. And I, and I try to, uh, you know, I'd also would try to reach other specialties. For a while, I was, um, you know, very fascinated with the interaction of hematology. And, you know, we are in all different specialties, our diseases. And I would do focus tweets this was months ago, like on nephrohematology or cardiohematology and reaching into those audiences. And it, it worked because I started engaging with non-hematologists and then they started following me. So um, that was there was intent to that. It wasn't just random. Now, you had said that you weren't enamored of Twitter initially. Um, is it your clear medium of choice or exclusively? Because you also said, well, you're implored to make videos and um and we've interviewed other guests who who are really prolific on youtube and do uh great videos that reach people all over the world um it, it is i think that you've found a, a great way to teach via twitter both between your well-crafted and remarkably dense for 280 characters uh, teaching. I mean, that's it's like a, a whole outline of a subject in 280 characters, um, as well as polls. But are you thinking of, or are you are you already doing, you know, this kind of stuff and putting it out on Instagram and you know in graphical form or videos or or other platforms? Yes, that's, that's a great question. So as far as other social media platforms, I tried Instagram. That's just, that's not my thing. I, I don't think I'll ever be an Instagrammer. Uh, um, and then, you know, Facebook was my original social media uh, uh, back in, and, and I, I just think of Facebook as that's where I post cute pictures of my kids and family stuff. It's just a different, I don't mix those two. And like, you know, I'm not going to be posting pictures of my kids. I think I did once of them playing guitar because I thought it was cool, but that, that not that's not what I'm using Twitter for. So Twitter is my medium uh, of choice. Uh, um, I barely actually use Facebook anymore. And I use Twitter basically for what we, we talked about. Now, as far as videos, um, I've been asked by a lot and a lot of, um, especially internationally, if there's a way that they can access my teaching, uh, if I can record stuff. And to be honest, I, I would love to do that. Um, the issues at hand are, uh, I'm not 
uh, the most technolo technologically skilled uh, individual <laughs> uh, um, as far as stuff like that and like creating a site and do uploading. I, you know, and then time. Um, I am a, I'm a clinician and uh, I am very busy clinically. And uh, with what time I don't have clinically, uh, I have three young daughters and a wife. I live in San Diego. I, I work out. I play a lot of guitar. And those things are super important to me. And right now, a lot more important than making videos. Although I would like to, if I could somehow like, you know, financially change, change the work, time space. You should, yeah, you yeah, just I need to alter it. the time space continuum. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I honestly, if I, if someone would right now would say your job could be maybe a little bit of, and I love clinical medicine, but mainly just teaching, teaching fellows this and devoting to that, like that would be the most rewarding job for me. Um, but that being said, I think part of the reason why I think I'm a good teacher uh, and the content I have is because I'm so busy clinically and, and do a lot of clinical medicine. Uh, um, so, you know, if I gave that up, maybe I would have more time, but maybe I would be less effective at it. So, Aaron, one of the things that you sort of talked about was also, um, you know, yes, the time uh, restraints. But uh, have you also encountered, um, you know, as you're beginning to talk about really these complex topics that you get a lot of engagement? Sure. But do you also get questions? Um, do people DM you and, you know, ask for advice on their own individual um, conditions? And what is your stance? sort of engagement with with regards to direct medical advice yeah i get i get a lot of those and that was just, i do keep i my suspected DM, as much i do keep my dm open for all and i there's probably and i apologize to him and listen i have probably hundreds that i've not even looked at or it's just a lot and um I, I i initially when i started getting those i would reply and say you know i just can't you know i can't give advice uh, uh um uh, about it. And now when I see, when the, I get people ask about direct medical questions regarding um, uh, 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 themselves or a family member, I, I just, I, I just don't respond. I don't know what to do. And I, I don't want, you know, I think it's a tricky situation, uh, both legally and just, you know, the, all I'm getting is a little bit of information. I can't even give, these are complex things. So that's how I've, I've done it. I actually have never talked to other people, how they handle situations like that. But now if it's related to that, I just kind of ignore well, let me, I also wondered about, you know, your teaching audience, you're so prolific for the medical professionals, but we also increasingly, at least in solid tumor, and I would imagine it's the same in, in heme malignancies too, that there's online groups that get pretty knowledgeable and, you know, and share information. I started a cancer education nonprofit more than a decade ago. But it is, it's, it's a touchy issue. You don't want to give personal information. And I think, you know, if I just never use the word should for anything, but people may ask individualized questions and you, I give general answers to, okay, well, here's what the data say, and here's what we commonly do without saying, and you should do X, Y, or Z. Um, but I do wonder about, you know, where, patient education fits in. Maybe it's that third rail that you don't want to get involved with, but, you know, as an educator and, and as a clinician, I mean, it's, it clearly is a talent and a, you know, kind of a passion for you that that's, that's part of the process is I'm, I know, cause you allude to how much time you spend uh, talking with patients in, in the exam room. And for me, one of the motivations of creating educational content for patients was that you don't want that great conversation to evaporate into the room and, and never be of any use to anybody who isn't there with you. If you can potentially have that uploaded to the world so other people can learn about it. I, I don't know what your thoughts are about that. If, uh, if, it's to you uh, different enough or medical legally challenging enough that you just rather not go there. No. So um, I will say I have, I do have, I know, which was one, one of the weird things about Twitter. I, I have patients, even my own <laughs> patients uh, that follow me and patients with cancer who follow me probably quite a bit now. And um, it definitely I think very hard before I tweet now, maybe not so much as I was because the last thing and, you know, whether, you know, I don't want to hurt or offend anyone dealing with cancer. I mean, that's a no brainer. But if I, even if those aren't my intentions and I do, 
I want to know about it because that's not what I want to happen. I, I, I need that feedback. And, um, you know, I definitely, a particular, I, you know, uh, the multiple myeloma, um, patient advocacy group is pretty strong. Um, yeah. you know, it's a disease that for good, for good reason, they live for a long time and they get educated and there's a big, and, um, I've definitely, at least earlier, I'm trying to do less when I was critical of some myeloma drugs, um, really angered some patients and I didn't want it to come that way. Angered enough where, um, they were like, don't see Dr. Goodman. He's, you know, denying his patients, uh, uh care. Cause I wouldn't use a particular drug, which I won't mention. Uh, um, you know, so I definitely think about those things. And, and now you're kind of giving me an idea because, you know, any of my patients who who know who I take care of, they know I love using the I have a, we have a big whiteboard in our clinic rooms. And, man, I, I use it. And um, especially during consents and initial diagnosis. And I spend uh, at least 40, sometimes the whole hour literally educating the patient on their disease. And the, the fellows love coming in and watching how I do it for different states. And uh, um, not to give myself pride, they're always like that was like great how you do it. And, you know, and I, 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 I almost should record myself giving the talk. I mean, whenever I see someone with cancer and it's a new diagnosis, I literally start from the basics. I explain to them what cancer is like, and I, I go, and I'm, I, you know, I kind of explain like DNA, how it's code. I'm now you have a whole thing that I've done a thousand times. And I just spend 10 minutes to explain them what cancer is. And then I get to, well, now you have a blood cancer, which is sometimes more conceptually hard than a lung cancer or a solid tumor to understand. And I start back at the bone marrow and, you know, you go to the butcher, you see the center of the ham hock, it's red, that's your bone marrow, you know, and I go through the whole thing and um, patients, I definitely feel appreciate it. Um, and definitely know more about their disease. And then it just makes everything else easier. Um, and you're kind of right. Maybe that is worth somehow expanding and letting people see, uh, cause I do think how I do it is really well. And anyone who's done a lot of consensus and patient education, you know, they've learned bad and good from all the people they've shadowed. And every time you see someone who does this, when I was in training, you'd be like, they did that pretty good. Or man, that's something I don't want to ever do. You've seen that. You learn just as much from the bad ones as the good ones. Uh, and that's how I kind of crafted it. And uh, uh, I, I enjoy teaching my patients, if not more than the, the medical students. I mean, it, you know, when you get to, you know, teach, especially with these rare cancers, which is why I like heme, everything in, 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 in heme, you know, individually is somewhat rare. Uh, it gives them knowledge and, and understanding and, 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 uh, uh you know, and then I learned from them. So uh, I hope that made sense, my answer. But uh, you're giving me ideas. I don't know Good. how I'll implement it, but. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, this is going to be one more thing for you to do in the limited amount yes, of time you, you have, right? <laughs> <laughs> Create videos. I recommend giving up your kids. <laughs> You'll have so much more time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you um, about keeping up with med medical literature. You know, you, you initially told us that one way or one reason to join Twitter for you was to, you know, keep up with the latest advances. And, you know, now a lot of people are following you and while they're learning basics as well as management, um, many of us, including myself, you know, I think I'm on Twitter because I really like to, you know, understand the conversation around new treatments and lung cancer and also updates from conferences. You know, I'm studying for the boards this year and I find that that a book that was published last year is already outdated. Um, you know, the, the management has completely changed for I think the majority of the cancers that were published last year because of new approvals, new indications. And in your view, in the next five to 10 years, do you think books are going to completely go away and we are going to be learning from social media and changing our practices based on every meeting that comes by. I mean, you you talked about this. You wrote a book on, I think, CAR T-cell therapy and it was obsolete by the time it came out. <laughs> Tell us what do you think is going to happen in five to 10 years? Are you way is just engaging on Twitter the way or will we be doing something completely different? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's there's really when I uh, separate my learning and my teaching, there's two types of learning. There is, uh, uh, you know, learning the basics uh, of your field, which you should learn in fellowship and, and core concepts, which largely won't change, hopefully, too much. And that's where books are are, are of use. So in hematology, um, you know, the the Ash Education book and the Ash SAP that come out every year or so. Um, 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 are great books for that and reading through, you know, the introduction to these diseases, their flow, their basic biology, and some general management principles. So um, I think books, I think books will always have a place. 
I think books will always have a place uh, for that type of learning. Um, now, as far as, um, you know, management, yeah, books are, I mean, there's no good management book. I, it's outdated by the time, well, you know, it's great. Things are, we're moving so fast in oncology. And that's where Twitter um, um, is the most useful, at least for me, uh, um, not just management, but for new prognostic scoring systems and to kind of see, you know, what everyone else is doing and what they're thinking. I may not always agree. I actually disagree a lot, but at least gives me a better understanding of that. And uh, following the right people um, can really help with that, who share the right literature. And that's where you need to maybe follow some of the big names who are really only dedicated to one cancer, who have the time to really synthesize and go through the most important literature. And usually when they share it, it's for good reason. And then I think the third pillar, which is what I still do usually every Thursday, um, I don't go through all the journals. I go through like the big three. You know, there's not that many. I, you know, JCO, I go through blood. Um, don't kill me journals if I don't mention you. There's a few other ones I, I go through and I just look, look at the abstracts. And uh, if it's anywhere remotely, like I think useful, I try to read some of it or at least save the paper. And again, when I'm on Twitter, I think a lot of people do this. I know I'm not the only one. Uh, when I come across an interesting paper, I email to myself. Uh, to make sure it's there. And then I, I have like, um, that's a whole nother episode. Like I call it my, um, my collection I refer to. I have like this awesome literature collection on my computer organized, like it's organized in a logical way, which I encourage anyone to do it. But I, I have it by, you know, disease state. And then like, you know, if I want to know, well, what are we using now at first relapse for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I click my DLBCL, I click relapse, and then I have fit versus not fit. And it gets me exactly where I need to go, even though I don't like I would no way remember it any other ways. And that's how I can get to like my collection and what I need to know when I'm taking care of patients. And once you build that uh, um, um, and now I've been building it for five years, like I can answer most of my questions, even though I don't remember it all. I just have my collection and I go to my, my spot. Twitter has definitely helped me grow that collection uh, and find papers that I wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. Have found. I think back of in my medical training you used to trade the the hard copies of of the journal articles like baseball cards at you know in rounds you'd hand them out all the time and i had rooms full of all these file cabinets that uh, oh, i've purged over the years and it was uh, it's much better at least in the electronic form that they don't take up all the space in in your home uh, can we talk about polls because i think that you know you're you do more polls and do them more successfully on Twitter than I think any other, at least heme onc person, maybe other, any other physician. Um, and it's great to have that kind of engagement and get hundreds, 500, 1,000, sometimes well over 1,000 responses in a day or a couple of days. Can you talk about what led you to do it because it sounded like you didn't you know you didn't storm onto twitter just to ask polls you stumbled into this but you're prolific in doing them and it's clearly resonant with what people want to be talking about what do you do them for and what do you get out of it is it to kind of make a point to teach is it to gather opinions on the landscape and what's actually being done out there uh, you know do you do you use this information once it's it's uh, obtained to kind of offer some additional follow up commentary on it? Uh, you know, things just what are your thoughts on how you're using polls? Because I think, honestly, I think that the whole Hemonk community, if not the broader medical community, can learn from that. Yeah, no. Um, so I use polls for a few reasons. First, before the you know, the HIPAA police come out and get me. I never use, these are all hypothetical, uh, I assure you, I've never taken someone straight from my clinic. Uh, but when I started using polls, you know, there is um, part of why our job, you know, it's an art and a science, blah, blah, blah. But part of what's so enjoyable about our job is, um, you know, we're scientists and use data, but it's just not clear cut a lot of the time. And that's what makes our job rewarding and difficult. Um, and I first started doing, you know, there were these Com there were these scenarios that I was encountering all the time in clinic where it just wasn't straightforward. And I was like scared. I go, I don't want to make the wrong decision. So I was like, I just now I have a lot of followers. What are people doing in it? And I would post these complex scenarios. They're usually picked where there's some controversy around it and there's no clear cut. 
And lo and behold, I'd get like 25% for each choice. And <laughs> what, what that told, it made me feel better. It was like, you know what? I have a bunch of hematologists who follow me. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some people just filling in the bubbles, but I know I have a lot of hematologists following me, including brilliant people from all over the world. And there is clearly no right answer. And it made me feel better when I'm dealing with my patients and knowing like the uncertainty I had around my clinical decisions. It's because there is no right answer and you're just doing the best you can. And um, so most of my polls are not are, are around uncertainty and to really kind of show the hematology community that there is no right answer, even though as dogmatic as we might be. And I also use it, I want, I, you know, this sounds weird, but like I want Papa Heme to be a platform almost, you know, it, when I ask those questions, it always sparks up a, a debate amongst experts, community physicians, and that's what I want. And for the most part, it's friendly debate. Only occasionally it gets carried away and then I mute that. Um, but um, yeah, there's friendly debate. And um, I think people like that. They, they, and you can see these experts, you know, I post something on AML. I had some like AML guru. Uh, she was posting what, 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 what she would do. And that was cool uh, based off my question. And so those are the reasons why I do polls. Now, as far as the, the um, why are so many people engaging, um, I don't know. I was surprised too. I mean, I have had a few, uh, you know, there's some, there's another Twitter guy who likes to keep track of this and I'm usually number one now on, uh, on polls. Uh, I don't do it for that, but I, I, I think the reason why there's so much engagement is because I'm choosing the right questions and I happen to have, I think hematologists, uh, maybe more so than other fields of medicine for whatever reason, as I alluded to earlier, like pathologists are really engaged on this platform and look at it every day. And, and uh, that's why there's the numbers. I can't explain it though better than that. Yeah, that's cool. I'd like to um, dig into this um, follower versus following uh, ratio a little bit, if you will. Um, humor me. So you started off by following people, right? But then your followers grew, and I noticed that you have a very distinctive follow followers to following ratio. And how do you control that? And how do you are you very cognizant about who you follow, or given how much flooded your feed? notification of likes as well as retweets etc and that you find that it's just difficult for you to find find the time to find new people and you know you're sort of creating content managing your notifications and really don't have time to hit follow um anymore so so tell me is that intentional or is just um a feature of your success yeah so um you know, I think, and I think we all know this, so I'll just say it, like if you're thinking about following someone and there's a gazillion people following them, but they're not following anyone else. It's like, okay, maybe I, I should follow this guy. <laughs> like, you know, that's what, the, you know, clearly this, this, this is good content. Uh, um, so that's part of it. But also, you know, I, I follow, I, I follow people that I find interesting and not all of the people I follow. You can go, look, there's some with not many followers or uh, um, um, occasionally I'll just have some really nice people who continuously comment how gracious they are. And I, you know, I'll follow, especially when they're from other countries and I wouldn't have had any interaction with them. And then uh, initially I did follow more bigger names, but like, you know, I get irritated or pissed off. You know, uh, I, I don't want to blog on a Twitter and be pissed off. So it's just, I don't follow them. I don't see their stuff. And that saves that, um, um, you know, or so, so that's kind of. <laughs> So like, you know, I'll just say, you know, with, you know, a lot of some myeloma doctors, it was just like, I, I didn't want to hear what they had to say, their same stuff every day. And it was like, I was like, if you get so annoyed, just like, why would you introduce that into your life? I was like, you're right. And, you know, as opposed to me just yelling at them back, I just don't follow them and I don't see their stuff. It's like, it doesn't exist. I mean, that's the beauty of, of social media. You get to see kind of what you want, which is the good and the bad, because, you know, you could have the wrong ideas, uh, uh, which is, I think, the biggest problem of social media. And you can get your own echo chamber and amplify them, uh, whether it's anti-vax or whatever you want to do, uh, um, and feel like you're right because you've crafted that. And, um, you know, so uh, I do I do follow people who I disagree with, but there was some of that going on. And and by the same token, it seems that you're uh, you know pretty focused on team and you know teaching, and you're not screaming into the void about politics and COVID, and you know people use use social media for different things, and some people have uh, have had great success. Uh, with it as a platform for the marriage of 
of medicine and healthcare policy and things like that. But I don't see that from you. I think you're, you're, yeah. you don't bring in your kids very much at all. You don't, you don't talk about politics and, and things. And, and I think that that seems to be your style as far as I can see. Yeah. It, it, it helps. Maybe that's why you're Zen and I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, listen, like uh, you know, I wear a mask and I, I I'm pro vaccine. I just don't tweet about it. You know, there's enough people doing that. Uh, um, and um, you know, I don't get. I'm well. This is my feeling, so don't be mad at me if this is how I feel. But I don't get much out of reading the, you know, gazillion tweets about those kinds of things that are all the same and nonstop. That and um, I agree with you. I think people know with my account they're gonna get. I think unique content that's thoughtful and maybe a little funny. And that's, you know, that's what they're going to get with, with my account. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to pivot and do that other stuff because I don't like reading about it. I don't go to Twitter for that. I know some people do. And so then they tweet about it, but that's not my main purpose. Uh, That's great. Um, I think one of the other questions we wanted to ask you was, how do you find the time for this? You know, you talked about you're very busy clinically. I mean, you're a bone marrow transplant physician. There's significant amount of inpatient service time. You know, you're an academic oncologist. There's demands um, to educate, teach, serve on committees. Uh, You have a young family. Um, How do you make time to dedicate to curate content um, you know, we talked a little bit about restraints in terms of expanding your enterprise, if you will. Uh, but currently, how do you do it? Educate us. Yeah. So um, in the morning, uh, so my wife's an anesthesiologist and she, I don't know how they do it. You know, she gets up at five, you know, I got, you know, that, you know, they get up early uh, um, and it's usually me and the kids till about seven, seven fifteen. Then we have a nanny come in. Um, and so from about six to seven, the the kids are kind of waking up and yeah, there's maybe a little TV in the morning and their cereal. And uh, I usually um, uh, sign on to Twitter during that time point. And I try to make it a point at least most days to do at least one or two tweets in that six to seven in the morning, California time. If people now will see why uh, that's when they see my tweets. And um, for a while, when I was doing uh, a lot of teaching, I would just kind of think through my week about what was clinically challenging or interesting. And that would kind of spark the content. And that's what I would do. I would even just kind of, I have a, I love the, I'm a huge fan of the ash and the ash uh, sap and education book. I have those every version printed out all over my house. So some days I would just flip it open and be like, okay, here's this. I can make this more simple than no offense to the writers, more simple and make it into a tweet. And, you know, there's unlimited content there. And I'll try to do one or two of those every morning. And um, people who round with me now on BMT, you know, you know, I, you know, we need to, I am a guy who has never really ate lunch at work. So uh, that's how I justify this. I never, I, I can go for a while without eating. I eat a lot when I'm hungry. I just don't take big breaks for food and all that stuff. So, but my team, I respect and they need that. And so like in between rounds, when we're taking, you know, we take our little breathers, I'll hop onto Twitter and, you know, fire off a tweet or two of uh, what's been going on or what I'm thinking about. And then, uh, so that's how I find the time. So it's not, I don't, I don't think my wife might disagree. We'll see what she says when she hears this. Um, I don't think I have, I, I mean, I'm not on this thing nonstop. I mean, it is a distraction and, you know, I do get glares or yells at, which I deserve at six at night. When I'm, you know, if I'm on my iPhone, as opposed to engaging with my family, I deserve to be yelled at and shoot out. Um, but I, I, I think with the way I have it, I have a good time limit, but the, the, that's, I really can't do much more time than I'm doing now. I mean, there isn't any right. more time. What do you, you'd mentioned earlier on that, uh, you know, one of the issues that you see in, in heme malignancy, but I think it, it, it's throughout heme onc, probably throughout medicine, is a tendency to, uh, to maybe overtreat, um, you know, don't just stand there, do something, you know, maybe. And, and, and I, I know that you've written about, um, you know, uh, maintenance therapy, and um, which we do in lung cancer. And um, it, you know, I think rituxan was one of the early things. And it's, it's, it's a paradigm that's very widely applied now. Um, and I think there are some data to support it in various settings. But if you see uh, what you perceive as over-treatment in, in a setting like that, uh, whether maintenance or adjuvant or something do you do you interpret it as well-intended uh, just 
ang- anxious to intervene and do more, or do you see it as largely pharma induced, uh, you know, profit, or is it an even, you know, the perfect storm of those, those angles? Yeah, I, I try not to be so controversial on Twitter, although some think I am, and it does rely, does revolve the things that do get me angry or, or fired up, as one would say, on, on Twitter or just even amongst our discussions as our group and journal boards is the ideas of maintenance uh, over treatment, um, you know, three versus two regimens where we with active agents where we know very well response rate will go up, but that's not the fundamental uh, thing. And then toxicity to patients. And um, I truly believe I mean, most oncologists, even those who are doing these things that I disagree with, they're not they're honestly doing because they think it helps patients. I, I don't think they're malicious. I mean, there may be whatever, but I think they're doing because they think that's the best. And that's kind of what that's where it actually makes me more angry. Not that they're they're not bad people. They're good people. But they think what they're doing is best where I truly believe what they're doing is wrong. And it's a it's a fact of how we you're right. The perfect storm, how we you know, it's human nature. We're seeing something with catastrophic illness and like feels weird to say, well, we shouldn't do anything. It just feels better giving therapy, giving active therapy pharma pushing it, and then how we're taught and learned. So I think it's a combination of all those three. Well, and yeah. if I can refine it, I mean, yeah. some of how we're taught and learn, a lot of it is is pharma funded too. So I think that you know, one question is, are we marinating in these endpoints because because they're raining down on us. And, and uh, you know, that's, I think, part of the question. I mean, I think what you're getting at is, yeah, people are, there are endpoints to support all this. You just think they're the wrong endpoints. But have we all been collectively brainwashed um, and lost our tethering to what really matters or should matter to patients? Yeah, I, I think we have lost it what matters. As many have pointed out before me, you know, with uh, surrogate endpoints and the tumor shrinking on a scan that although is an endpoint, it's not really what our patients want. As I always break down and I've done this tweet a few times, what our patients want is to live longer and feel better. Uh, that is what all of our work as an oncologist should be geared towards. And um, I, that's what that's where the anger comes in. We have controls on colleges to end this. These studies that are either poor a poor control arm, which I've now written papers on, uh, or, or a crap endpoint that's really not going to push the needle. We have all the power. All we have to say is we're not going to open this study, right? These studies cannot run without the clinical investigators. And we turn down now our group. I mean, we we will not open a crap control arm at University of California San Diego. Uh, we don't, and we turn them down. Uh, um, and. Well, I, that's what angers me. And then but the further anger is then these we have our ash or for you guys, ASCO, and like we're drinking our champagne, applauding this and like, <laughs> like, what's wrong with us? Like, you know, you just compared three drugs to two drugs where the two drugs was clearly not the standard of care at the time of enrollment. So, and then I'm called the bad guy for pointing that out. Uh, uh, like, that's where I lose my and that's sometimes where I have to take the break. And again, these aren't bad people. You know, I had the author of one of these studies be like, you are so awful. that, And I, I never point out authors. I don't make it personal. Um, but I, 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 you know, I do feel strongly about these things. And I don't like I don't feel like we shouldn't hide. And if we keep, if, you know, when if we're not allowed to critique these things, then then that's the opposite of all we stand for, and it, this will continue to happen. I, I hope I'm coming clear with what what my feelings are, what I'm yeah. trying to explain. But um, uh, believe me, yeah. I, I and I don't know how to change you, it. <laughs> I don't know how to change it, and I know you're vocal about the uh, you know the adjuvant, uh, right? Osimertinib. I didn't know yeah. about that till I read your you know how it's now approved, and I agree with you. I mean, the data looks good, but like survival is what matters and that you know someone will argue they do this all the time in myeloma well a broken hip you know if you're going to delay that that's important like in the treatment of smoldering myeloma but then i go show me that that is what happens and if you actually go look at the data how many broken hips were prevented it's actually none it's like a it's a clinically insignificant anemia or a creatinine a 1.2 you know so these hard endpoints that i agree with if you could prevent a brain uh, met in lung cancer or a broken hip in myeloma, that I actually do think then maybe it is worth subjecting some asymptomatic individuals who won't ever need that therapy to it, but they don't show that. And that's, so they kind of just change it on you. And that, that gets me angry. 
Well, it's a good anchor. That's all. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm just validating myself, but you know, I, I think, and I, I do think part of having a, you know, the passionate following that you have that, uh, Vinay Prasad or Michel Giawali and some others, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it, it's tapping into, there are other people who feel this way or would like to be thinking critically. I think it's a, it's a good skill. Um, and again, it's, it's against a tide of what is being kind of spoon fed from, from funded uh, programs. Anyway, yeah. No, I, and I don't know. A part of me is like, well, what's the solution? I don't know the solution to the problem. I mean, if everyone, I guess, thought, thought like us, that would be solved. But I, I don't know. You know, uh, I don't know the solution. And and um, you know, maybe Twitter is part of the solution. Maybe more fellows. Uh, and I'm I make it a point to go to the fellow clubs and try to present opposite ideas. You know, um, but I don't know the perfect solution to the problem. Yeah, no, I think this sounds very similar to some of the discussions we've had around, you know, do we accept the data as is or do we actually make noise? And, you know, you're so very right that we've discussed issues before, but, you know, we never have a clear answer or resolution on what the solution may be. So uh, I think both Jack and I hear you quite loud and clear here and, you know, would offer you no no argument. Uh, we would like to end uh, with asking you about your music. Um, and um, do you find time for it uh, based on, you know, how busy you are with all the different aspects? And um, well, when did what, this all begin? I, I'd love to know as uh, I didn't, I always wanted to play guitar and started it after fellowship. And the, my instructor confided that he was pretty skeptical that some adult physician would make the time to do guitar. Now, I, I, I'm, and he's kind of right, because I, I, I did play, but I, I have never, I've never done it at the level that you do, and certainly not consistently. So I just want to know, like, was this always something you did? And is because you, you're in front of audiences playing in a band, right? So tell us about that. And are you going to uh, are you part of uh, a BMT band or is there such a thing that's ever going to happen? Yeah. So uh, I've always been in music. My parents had a piano growing up and I would bang on it. Unlike my brother who has many skills that I do not have. Um, he was a much better athlete. Um, you know, and uh, I, uh, uh, in third grade, when the opportunity came that you could pick up cello, you know, an instrument, I said, I want to be in school cello. And um, I was but I kept on inverting it and playing like a guitar because I listened to like, you know, I was into Nirvana. Metal, I was into that kind of music. I always, you know, I uh, was into that kind of music. And my dad's like, just get a freaking guitar. So he bought me an acoustic guitar. Um, and I, you know, I just think with some it clicks or not. And, you know, some I just would play every night literally till my fingers bled. Um, I loved it. And I had I, I knew what my goal was. It was to be able to play those solos you see people I saw I knew the end point the end point was for me in this study was being able to play the solos that I see slash enter Sam and your uh, Metallica without thinking like it looks like when they do it like how are they doing it and so you know and it took years uh, um and um not, I'm not bragging but I can do that now and um the thing with guitar um it's just like hematology for me it's unlimited knowledge there's always more you can do with it uh, um and um uh, you know, in college, I learned music theory and I, you know, I went hardcore with it and uh, I learned how uh, uh, song construction works. And, you know, I compose music. Yeah, I can do it. And I picked up piano, uh, bass, uh, a little bit of drums. And um, in every step of the way, I've been in a band uh, from high school uh, in medical school. We were called Saturday Night Palsy um, in um <laughs> In, in a residency, we were the Coumadin hostages. That's when we used to give Coumadin still. So we were the Coumadin hostages. You know when patients couldn't leave the hospital because their <laughs> INR wasn't high enough yet. Okay, for the young ones watching. Um, and um, and then in a fellowship, actually, fellowship was, uh, uh, it was occasional reunions with my old bands. And then now uh, during COVID, um, my uh, neighbor and I, who's a, a, a guitarist, we just... Every evening with the kids playing outside, we live in San Diego, we're fortunate. So the whole last year and a half, we learned like 50 songs and uh, um, some good ones too. And um, we now play occasionally at places around the San Diego area uh, where, we, where we play. So it's not a full band right now, it's just an acoustic set, uh, but we do some pretty good stuff. And um, 
what I find time, um, it's usually after the kids go to, well, you know, if the kids are sitting there watching TV. I'm usually the guy there with my acoustic guitar and the kids are yelling at me. Um, uh, uh, late at night, I, I like my favorite part of the day is, you know, when the kids are asleep, I can go outside with my acoustic guitar. I can have a beer uh, in Pacific Beach, San Diego, say hi to all my neighbors who walk by and uh, I play my acoustic guitar and um, I still am learning. I just bought new exercise books that, you know, I wanted to learn new techniques. And so I bought guitar exercise books and it drives my wife crazy because they don't sound interesting when you listen to them, but they're working on specific patterns to build your strength and memory. And um, um, so, uh, yes, I love music and I will play guitar until I can't, which hopefully is never. That's great. If I That's amazing. Now you just need to multitask your guitar fingers with your Twitter fingers. Yeah. <laughs> you can still learn. listen, I'm being serious. I and it, what made me happy is the local guitar shop that I frequent quite a bit. Guitar sales went through the roof during COVID. Um they, they were busier than ever um, um for obvious reasons and I think the hardest part of guitar is it's those first month where you just you hit that wall once you get through that first month and you train your fingers in the hand-eye coordination and you can play those chords, you'll be amazed after one to two months of guitar, just learning eight chords, you can play 90% of pop music. And then it feeds on itself once you can start doing that. So you just, you have to literally just do it an hour every night, even though your fingers can't do it and it will get it. Uh, you know, I can't promise you'll be Slash or Van Halen, but, but you'll get it. I just think it's, that's where I see a lot of people quit. They get frustrated, just like with anything. Well, I do think it's, it's really interesting that you know i was told you it's a good exercise because there is you can learn to do it it's not that you're incapable i mean uh it's a skill it just takes time but you can't crash for this test you can't just spend seven hours in one night to become as good as spending a half hour for 14 straight days and so uh, and i think that's a valuable lesson and you may be the first person to have said guitar is just like hematology. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think we might have to tweak that. <laughs> I mean, our field's great. I mean, so is all science. Like, there's just unlimited stuff that you could learn. Like, you, you're even if you're an expert in something, like it's just unlimited. And, and, and that's how I feel about guitar. It's got unlimited stuff to offer. That's cool. Well, yeah. I look forward well, Aaron, to Aaron, this has been so much fun. Uh, we love your energy. And I think uh, we'll have to double check Jack and I, but this is our one year anniversary of doing this podcast. So we're so very happy that you joined us today. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thank you I'm going to have to subscribe and start listening. Yeah. Do, do some I mean, stuff. come on, high time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can find us on iTunes or wherever you find your podcast content. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe, oh. whether on the podcast service or our website, weekendmetic.com, YouTube, etc. Leave us a review, share with a friend, make a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we can be reached at beyondthejournalshow at gmail.com. And we thank Mark Lindsay and Talking Speaker for production and distribution support. See you in a couple of weeks with our next guest. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.